You did great. Hi, we are Spike Capital, and this is our investment analysis of Radius Recycling. A brief agenda for what we're going to cover today, and we're going to start off with a brief company snapshot, move into an industry overview, then our financial analysis, and then finishing up with our investment recommendations. So, Radius Recycling is one of the largest metals recycling companies in America, with locations across both America, well, US, and Canada. There are three segments of their business, the metal recycling, auto recycling, and steel manufacturing. Given the number of metal recycling and auto recycling facilities, those two segments represent the majority of Radius's revenue. It's also worth noting that both the byproducts of the auto recycling and steel metal segment are used to supply the metal recycling facilities. Here are the executive, the veteran executive board members. Cameron Lundgren is the chairman and CEO. Richard Beach is the executive vice, executive vice president and the chief strategy officer. Stefano Rubini is the senior vice president and CFO. Stephen Heisel is the senior vice president and president of product and services. It's important to mention that there are several other board members that are not listed here. However, they are all relatively new and unproven. Jeffrey Ryan is the ESG. Uh, Radius shows a strong commitment to sustainability with a carbon net neutrality across all three of their operations. However, we have concerns in their greenhouse gas emissions prior or post their environmental incidents. With their social, they have a strong commitment to diversity, as demonstrated to their four to three female to male executive board, and they've won the best place to work award for three years in a row. With their governance, they have a highly experienced C suite. However, with this experience comes a cost. And through our analysis, their cost is a little bit higher than uh, other considerable companies. And, uh, but their board of directors is independent and they're elected democratically. As you can see, Radius has had a history of acquisitions that have allowed them to grow to their current size. Focusing on some of the recents, we have their acquisition of Oanta Metro Region, which has helped expand them across the US, and their official name change from Schneider Steel to Radius Recycling shows their new era and their always their goal to always expand. So we've talked a little bit about Radius, but we're going to talk about the industries that they operate in now. So they operate primarily in the recycled scrap metals industry and the auto recycling industry. And it's important to note that they're very closely linked together due to how young they both are. And with that, they're both newly relevant and also highly competitive. But something to note with both of these industries is they don't quite have very much buying power or selling power. They have to take prices that they are offered. And so the industry drivers focusing on the metal recycling industry because that is where primarily their income comes from. It historically was driven by the construction industry being both demanding of the recycled metals and supplying the old metals to be recycled. It's also linked to commodity pricing. They have to deal with whatever prices they're buying at and selling at, like I said before. Inflation and other macroeconomic trends, subject to price changes, maybe a recession comes in, they have to deal with that, unfortunately. And then a new one, big driver for demand is the expected shortage of critical metals. With that being said, people are all looking for a new way to find these metals that are being so important in new production. And so that's a big driver for the demand. Based on our analysis of Porter's Five Forces, we know that in the industry, buyers have a moderate bargaining power, while suppliers have a high power. We also know that the threat of new entrants is only moderate, due in part to the fact that there are high startup costs for new companies. However, the threat of substitutes is rather <coughs> high due to the fact that the interchangeability of metals with buyers is rather high. So I talked a little bit about how commodity was so important, but here's just a historical. As you can see, it's the last 12 months of the steel rebar prices. Um, and the profitability of Radius is directly linked to the profitability and the prices that is steel rebar because it is the primary export of their business as a ferrous metal compared to the small minority that is non-ferrous metals. And as you can see, started last year, it was at a high peak. It dipped down to quite a low margin for a while, but it has slowly risen back up to a more consistent price range. Some competitors of Radius are Olympic Steel, Timpanins, Corporations, and Commercial Metal Company. It should be noted that these companies are not in the scrapyard industry besides commercial metals with one or two. 
so that gives radius a diverse diverse avenue of revenues. It's just a brief kind of snapshot into our financial analysis of the company. Um, you can see here, obviously they did go net income negative in 2023. Um, for the purposes of our kind of forward-facing evaluation, we did choose to kind of take that year as an outlier considering all of the macroeconomic concerns that the economy faced. Um, so our forward-facing projections were largely based on the growth that we had seen in the five years prior to that net income negative year. Um, on that, into our valuation methodology, um, we did use a DCF valuation. You can see kind of just some of the snaps numbers that we used here. We used a perpetuity growth of 2%, just kind of a, a pretty baseline um, growth rate for that, ultimately getting down to a equity value per share of $23.66. Um, at the time that we conducted this analysis, their current share price was $26.33, showing an over 10% decrease in share price value for our financial analysis. Some trends and considerations, they're exceeding low and decreasing margins. They've had negative net income for the last four years. Um, they've had questionable asset allocation that we feel could be better used elsewhere. And we feel that their ESG investments, their projections are a little too high on them. And then just quickly looking at our SWOT analysis, some of the greatest strengths from Radius is their deep sea ports and their distribution tower to buyers. Uh, their weaknesses are, as you can see there, is they have a, uh, a, a liability to commit to their leases. And uh, their opportunities is one of their greatest strengths here, is that they're investing in the future heavily. They're expanding their property now and researching IT technologies to develop their business more. And then some of their threats is that they have a history of legal proceedings and they need to be careful to adhere to regulations to avoid these threats in the future. Yeah, so just kind of to move on to our final investment recommendation. Um, our overall investment recommendation is to sell. Um, this is primarily driven by concerning financials. Um, like we mentioned, for the past 10 years, they have been negative in net income. This is a big problem for us as, you know, as investors, for us, cash is king. And if they're not being able to consistently turn a cash profit, that's a pretty big um, concern for us. Also with China's entrance into the market, we talked a lot about industry drivers such as a potential increased demand for these metals that they're selling. Um, but something that they, they talked a lot about during their press release and something that we found consistently was China has now reached a point where they have enough of these recycled metals to start exporting. And they obviously have different you know, rules and regulations than we do in America. So they may be able to undercut Radius's recycling and gain a significant portion of their market share, stripping that growth potential away from Radius. Um, also, their questionable asset allocation, like we mentioned a little bit. We think that it's a little bit questionable you know, with, with some of the C-suite salaries you know, for, for a company that is struggling to maintain positive net, net income, having CEO salaries in the high millions and having you know, a corporate office being in Manhattan when there is really no operational advantage to that. We think that potentially you know, with better asset allocation, they could then reinvest that money that they saved into better initiatives that we would be more confident investing in. Um, also, the ECF valuation being below their current share price, um, that's a pretty big one. Obviously, there's a lot of you know, stories that the DCF doesn't tell, being that it is a purely intrinsic financial valuation. But we did also find that we used pretty optimistic projections. You know, we, we pretty much just completely discounted their negative in the year in, in 2023. So the fact that even our optimistic DCF was below their current share price was a pretty big tell for us that, you know, like we mentioned before, there are these you know, industry considerations, internal company considerations, on top of that being the financial considerations that we are a little bit concerned about. Also, their historical ESG concerns. Um, very apparent turnaround, you know, the, seen a significant investment in that, seen a significant outlook. They're expecting ESG to be kind of one of their main positive growth drivers going forward, but they have not proven that yet. And they still have a history of, you know, concerning lawsuits, concerning incidents that we feel like may impact them continuously going forward. And we're not confident that their new initiatives will be strong until they're proven. Um, also, just generally the cyclical nature of commodity prices. Um, in order for us to be confident investing in a business this directly tied to commodity pricing, we would have to see these other uh, considerations be positive. So the fact that we see you know, issues with 
the company issues with the company's placement, you know, within the industry, and that industry being that it is a commodity price-based industry, we have a very hard time coming to a recommendation to hold or sell. So, or excuse me, hold or buy. So we chose sell. Thank you. Well, your time was perfect. It was ten minutes zero zero. So nailed that. And, uh, yeah. Let's open it up to the uh, the panel for for questions. fundamental methodology at Select Capital is that we prefer to invest more in growth-based stocks. Um, we're a little bit concerned, you know, we didn't feel like they were paying a high enough dividend to justify the fact that we did not see a projection of growth that we believed in. You know, there are just, you know, to us, anytime you're investing in one stock, you're choosing not to invest that capital in another stock, right? And there are so many other really, really positive equities that pay bigger dividends and have stronger growth projections that even though you know they, they do have dividends and, and we didn't end up doing too much of a deep dive into their you know ability to cover just because we felt like it didn't matter because even in terms of dividends there were so many other equities that were better positioned uh, to give us better returns. Did you want to short the stock? Potentially. Um, when we first did our valuation, you know, we looked at this kind of over a span of months just to see if our valuation stood up. When we initially valued it. Um, back in December, their share price was 30. Um, when we valued it for our you know, research paper, it was down to 26, and now I believe it dropped another 10 or 15% since then. So definitely would consider shorting this. Um, but generally, you know, just with commodity pricing, I'm, I'm a relatively risk adverse person, so I have a hard time putting any sort of leverage based, shorter, or long on the commodity based. Do you feel like anybody would miss this company if it were to go away? Does it provide any value in the U.S. industry? I think it's a very important company due to its history. It's a very long history company, and though it would be unfortunate to see it go, um, it, it would be missed, yes, I think so, because they're also so incredibly committed to the future with all of their investments into having better environmental impacts. And the whole idea that their company is focusing around recycling metals and creating metal that way compared to trying to find new metals and sourcing it from mining, I think that whole effort of decarbonization would be missed. You guys have answered most of my questions. Uh, but so we're kind of getting into the weeds here, but you know what affects their collection costs? So for collection, they have two sources of scrap generation. They have their auto recycling industry, which offers a secondary source of income, but they were also said to have generated at least 20% of their scrap metal from their auto plants. And then the rest of that comes from recycling from the construction industry is a big one because people demand the new infrastructure to be built and that comes with tearing down old buildings and sourcing materials from there for when we're talking about lawn ferris materials. And because the way that is, they're offering a second party of taking this old money and refurbishing it. That is why a lot of the buyers have a lot more or a lot less power in coming towards the price and why the buyers can say, hey, what about these other guys that, you know, maybe they don't care so much about decarbonization, but they have a cheaper price. There's a lot of alternatives in the industry, like the larger companies, new core, especially. So it's a little bit of a hedge against a bow down, maybe, because mm -hmm. their collection costs are coming up. Yes. I always ask a little more. So in terms of insider uh, buying and selling, did you guys look at that? And what what did, what did you see in terms of the communication between the aggressive buying by management and what are their attitudes or selling? We did see, um, I'm blanking on the exact date, but there was a pretty significant portion of stock compensation that was sold off um, by one of their core management. Um, generally, we did not see very much confidence 
outside of that, we didn't we didn't see too much of an aggressive you know sell, but we also definitely didn't see too much of an aggressive buy. And the, and the fact that we only really saw that sell um, was a little bit concerning to us. But there was nothing too strong or strong enough on either side for us to add too much of a consideration. Going back to the three product segments, um, 54 metals facilities, 50 auto recycling, and one steel mill. Um, does the steel mill sound like maybe they provide steel to the, all the other facilities or something? Or what's the, is it an extraction for them? Is it a growth area of growth for them? Just uh, I can take this one. Perfect. So far, they've not really seen it as a area to grow in. I believe they acquired they acquired the steel mill even in the times before we put on the timeline, so I don't remember the exact date offhand. But they have they have not tried to expand in that area at all since then. And the steel manufacturing, it's only the one facility in Oregon. And while they do sell to some buyers and rips it, it generates a small amount of revenue, which is also used to to supply the metal recycling facilities and to generate more scrap metal from that. We'll add on that slightly be that we think when we you know had our conversation with the um, investor relations gentleman he talked a lot about how the steel mill truth of they didn't like it and they wanted to sell it they wanted to get get rid of it and also talked you know then about the initiative that they wanted to do with in terms of reinvesting that capital so we honestly value the steel mill more as its potential to be divested <coughs> than its actual production because the production was very clearly communicated to us was not holding up with the revenue streams of their other lines of business. And so our truthfully our hope would be as we invested was that they would divest this steel mill and then reinvest that capital into a different growth based initiative. Uh, two part I guess evaluation. So the first part is on that steel mill, did you take a shot at trying to value that operation or property to see what it might fetch in the open market? We did not too much. We did actually talk to um, a, a, a good a good partner of our firm, a good, a good friend of our firm, who was a industrials M and A banker for a while. A little bit about you know kind of what that sort of thing would be valued in terms of what approach should you take to that. You know what should you look into that. We didn't hugely take into you know valuing the the cash flow generation of the steel mill as much as we did you know like I said in terms of the value divestiture and we felt like you know it would be a very interesting thing to divest because past the financials something that was really concerning to us was the investor relations uh, gentleman telling us that it was not performing well and it was underperforming um, and we do know it with radius's financial struggles um, i would imagine based on the limited experience i've had in MA, that they are potentially being looked at by lbo firms um, so for us the valuation is a little bit more meant more based on a kind of holistic view, being that it was so low in value to begin with. I guess the second one real quick, since we're getting close on time, but it looks like in your financial analysis, you had net income. <coughs> if you remove the outlier, you're suggesting for 2023, you're looking at net income you know, up past $100 million per year. With $25 million short outstanding or so, that's, you're getting close to $4 per share in earnings on a price of $23. That's not a terrible price of earnings. I just think that's what, what, how much confidence do you have in that, that net income will continue to rise to ten, during what you said about some of the operations being in trouble? Yeah, so our, and I'm going to go back to it just so I can reference it a little bit. Um, our, as you can mean, obviously we, we got rid of this um, when we did our projections. So considering that in for the past 10 years they've had negative net income. Um, it would be some foolish for us to fully confidently say that in the next five they would have none, considering that they've averaged two for the last two periods of five years. Um, so truthfully, this is a very you know optimistic projection. We did you know account for some years of, of maybe downturn just because there you know there's going to be swings in income, there's going to be some risk involved always with projections. Um, but we did use a pretty optimistic revenue growth pro projection. Um, we wanted to take this to an extent as kind of their best case for financial analysis because we knew, you know, just with the industry analysis that we did and looking at the commodity prices that we weren't very confident in the company or in the industry. But we wanted to see if, you know, if maybe what if we take their 
projections at face value? What if we take these initiatives at what they say they're going to produce? And so this financial analysis was, was a very optimistic take on kind of in a sense just experimenting with different. And we did a few different um, estimations that we did some worst cases, um, but most of the worst cases truthfully ended up with the company being close to zero. Um, so we kept this one just because we think that it's the most realistic and we don't think a company this size will let that happen and we'll find some way to get out of it continuing to grow, especially with like we highlighted on the timeline stage with these acquisitions. They are very clearly growth oriented in the sense that they're very proactive in the space to try to improve the company. And we feel like at some point in the future that will work and they will turn around. We just feel like that's gonna be a long term and it's hard to make a long term investment in something like this when all of these projections could be completely shattered by a downturn in commodity prices. Awesome. Well, that's time and uh, great job guys. You can take a breath, you're, you're finally done and uh, you guys gonna make it to, to Brick West later?